Thank you all for joining us this evening. I think we're going to have some, some additional folks join us as the evening progresses. It's a uh, pleasure to be here. I'm Rob Muller. I'm Dean of the College of Education here at National Lewis. And we have some of, we have folks here in the room. We have some folks on uh, Zoom as well. And this is the um, latest in our series of focusing on some of the research and really important work that our faculty do around teacher education and teacher preparation. And today in particular, looking at um, English language learners and literacy. And just um, really pleased to have Kristen and her colleagues here um, to talk about their work. And we're trying to do more of this for our students, for our alums, uh, for faculty, and for our larger community. Because we think, you know, our impact as a college of education isn't just about courses and student teaching, but it's about how do we think about access? How do we think about excellence and quality? And particularly today, you know, issues surrounding English language learners. Kristen Lems is a senior member of the faculty here at the College of Education. She's focused on ESL and bilingual education for um, most of her career. Many of you probably know her more as a musician and have seen her, you know, in uh, playing around town, but uh, she also is a terrific teacher and educator. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Kristen to uh, set us up and tell us what's gonna happen this evening. So thank you all for coming. Thank you so much, Dean Muller. We're so pleased to be here. I'd like to start by uh, asking Dr. Junko Yokota, one of our very esteemed colleagues that we're so very proud to work with, to talk a little bit about the issues that went into uh, putting together a book like this, which tries to combine issues around literacy and reading with linguistics. Dr. Yokota, Junko Yokota. Thank you very much. First of all, congratulations. Congratulations for a beautifully created book on so many different levels. I was pleased to be asked to be a part of the, um, the group today in taking a closer look at this book because it took me back to both my teaching years and to my own personal childhood. I was the child who was sitting in your classroom who knew no English. English is my second language. And my mother sent me to school knowing one sentence, or rather, a question. Can you imagine what my mother sent me to school being able to say? Absolutely. She said, you should know how to say, may I go to the bathroom? That was it. That was my entire English vocabulary when I started school. And I remember all those times of trying to make sense out of what was happening around me. But this isn't another era. This isn't a time when there wasn't such a book as Building Literacy with English language learners, there wasn't such a focused way of looking at it. So I muddled in the back of the room knowing I should learn English because that's what everyone else around me is speaking. Even though at home we only spoke Japanese, um, I knew that I should make sense out of it. So I went home the first week of school and I said to my mother, I learned a new song at school. Ome zano telefon, ia ia yo. That sound kind of familiar? Okay, well, from the bad tuned song, I mean, I should never sing in front of a professional singer, right? Um, I had heard this line and I interpreted it as, telefon, ia, ia, yo. Well, you can hear that there's some similarities, but it's not the same. What I was telling to my mother is, oh, that early morning wake up call, I don't like it at all. Ia, ia, yo. I don't like it at all. Well, my mother thought, why would they teach this at school when they should be saying, you should be getting excited about going to school. It's going to be engaging. But what this whole story comes down to is we're constantly learning to make meaning. We're trying to make meaning out of things that don't make sense to us. And in all of that, back in that era, the only thing the teachers could do when I arrived in school not speaking English was to send me to speech therapy. Because I couldn't say television. I said terebi. I couldn't say radio. I said radio. These are all legitimately Japanese ways of saying it. And so I went off to speech therapy. But when I look at what's happening in our world today, we don't have the luxury of just saying, we don't know how to deal with you. You don't know this language well, or you know it differently. And so therefore, we're going to send you to a speech therapist so you can pronounce your words correctly. Instead today, what we need is raising citizens who can grow up to be literate in many ways. 
Literacy is textual literacy. Literacy is visual literacy. Literacy is emotional literacy. It's all those literacies, but in particular, the way of becoming literate for people who speak another language, who have the good fortune, the good fortune of being able to speak another language is through specific and targeted ways. When I was enjoying the time that I had in taking a look at this book, I was impressed with many of these specific things. For example, completely readable, personable, enjoyable. It wasn't like reading something that was only reference. It was full of story. But it wasn't just full of story. It was full of information. It wasn't just full of information. It was full of practical tips. How do a team of authors like this put something together that's both enjoyable, practical, and very specific in addressing the needs that we need to know. I have to say though, from my own point of view, as a literacy educator, I was also glad to see that so much of what was in this book was in fact, very much grounded in literacy. How do we become literate? It, it is absolutely grounded in research-based ways of knowing. But even beyond that research-based ways of knowing, there were very specific linguistic needs that were being addressed through their examples that were there. The vocabulary rich chapter openers to the glossary at the back, I constantly found myself nodding and saying, oh, I, oh, I, uh, I didn't know that. Oh, and so it was a new learning experience for me as well as a good nodding experience as well. The questions for further study, something that made me think more. And I think in our field of literacy development, we all need to keep challenging what we think we know to what we didn't know we needed to ask ourselves what we didn't know we should ask each other, what we didn't know we need to explore. So from the point of view of teaching literacy, I think that what they have done is really help us think about specifics, to question what we know and don't know, and to do it in a very timely way. The ways of looking at literacy development from the digital opportunities that we have around us, to considering the pitfalls of that which is enticing looking, but we should be very careful to know what we're getting into in the digital era. Everything from machine translations to the URLs of tweets, there are very specific and big picture ways of looking. I have to admit though, Kristen, that because you were a student of mine, isn't it great when you get to say someone so wonderful has been a student of yours? <laughs> Kristen was a student of mine and throughout the book, there are references to the highest quality literature. And in one moment of my own advertisement, my newest book is Thinking and Learning Through Children's Literature. I'm pleased to say that in this book that Kristen, Leah, and Tenena have put together, they reference the best of the literature. They don't make allowances in saying, it's not great, but it's the only book that we have about. No, they find the best quality examples. They bring in here American Born Chinese. They bring in here March, Persepolis, Francisco Jimenez and the Circuit. And they use this quality literature to say, here's how we can understand better through quality literature. Here's how we can relate better to students through quality literature. And here's how we can teach and learn together through quality literature. So congratulations to a wonderful team and to all the work you've done in putting together something that's meaningful and timely for all of us. Thank you so much, Junko. We're very honored. Thank you so much. Oh, am I blushing? <laughs> okay, so as we move into the presentation, we will remind you of how we got into this to begin with. Three professors teaching the linguistics and reading graduate course could not find a suitable textbook focusing on the linguistic aspects of English language education. Solution, we wrote our own textbook. <laughs> And here's a picture of us, oh gosh, those were the days. <laughs> in 2009, when we published the first edition, and this was the, the night that we submitted it. I think we pulled an all-nighter, if I recall. Yes. And here we are seven years later, <laughs> still laughing. Um, and there's the new edition. So we're going to talk about some of the things that are still true in literacy and some of the things that have changed in the last seven years without expecting you to have read the first edition or the second edition for that matter. So um, first we'll go to Tanena. Um, Dr. Tanena Soro is one of our um, very valued um, faculty here at National Lewis. He also teaches at Columbia College. 
he has his PhD in linguistics from Northwestern. So many, many times when we had a linguistics question, old photographic memory to Nana, <laughs> not old, had the answer. So here he is, to Nana Sorrow. Thank you, Christian. Where do I start? <laughs> what? Oh. <laughs> well, um, I want to take a minute to thank Yunko for her introduction because uh, I could relate to, to your experience and I'm going to share a little bit later about it. So, um, anyhow, these are the things that I'm going to be focusing on, the language language-based theory of learning by Holiday, Bix and Kalp, by Cummings, and languages and literacy as human rights. Um, still true is Holiday's language-based theory. As you can see here, there are three main areas that our learners have to deal with on a daily basis. They are learning the language, just like children learn their mother language. Um, and they have to go through stages, except the pre-linguistic stages of the cuckoo and uh, gaga, you know, uh, they don't go through those stages. They are also learning about the language meaning that they are learning about grammar and the sentences of, uh, sentence structures of uh, the language. And at the same time, they are learning language, they are learning uh, through language, meaning English, all the content areas. So it is, a challenge for them. And we as teachers, we have to make sure that we cover these three areas for a balanced literacy. Okay. Um, of course, Michael Halliday's theory is getting more recognition these days and his first theory has now morphed into what is known as systemic functional linguistics. Some call it systemic functional grammar. Um, the contention here is that the uh, systemists focus on what is known as repertoires. Because as speakers, we engage in language use in different social contexts. And based on those contexts, we rely on our own repertoires. And the role of the teacher is to make sure the, the student expand those repertoires when they are to deal with different social contexts, such as a job interview, you know, or science, or social studies, you know, various content specific areas, or even when it comes to formal versus informal, all those contexts are re relevant for the um, uh, functional ling linguists because they, differently from um, the innatist, they focus more on the social aspect of language. And of course, Vygotsky is part of the group. <laughs> uh, so true. Should I 
give some example of um, some people when they talk about repertoire some people don't like it you know especially teachers because you they see students mixing the language you know switching codes and but that's part of their by of multilingualism yeah so it's not too bad, as Junko pointed out earlier. <laughs> we can use that, you know, to help them learn. Um, the next concepts are Bix and Kalp. And these comes to us from uh, um, Cummins, who in his research noticed that um, ELLs did pretty well when it came to speaking the language. However, they had a lot of difficulties when it came to uh, uh, classroom tasks, you know, how to deal with those. And what he noticed is that the BICS, which is interpersonal communicative skills, also known as social or conversational language or playground language, you know, is based on the here and now, you know, where the uh, student can see your facial expressions, your gestures, you know, and can um, take the meaning from that context. And that's why uh, Bix is what is called context bound, okay? Uh, as opposed to CALP, which is Cognitive Language Academic Proficiency. And this is the language that is mostly used in the classroom, where you cannot rely on the facial expression or gestures of the speaker. All is textbook related and you have to make meaning out of that. And CALP is what is known as academic language. And most, if not all the, uh, the standard, standardized tests are gonna be CALP. So to succeed in school, our students need to be in possession of CALP. And um, shall we move on to the next? NCLB, we all know about what NCLB is, right? And No Child Left Behind has noticed the importance of those previous two concepts. And I've included them in um, NCLB Act, where we see more focus on academic language for students to reach their AYPs. Yeah. And of course, standards came into play. Now there is, uh, when you, you study vocabulary, there are tier one, tier two, tier three, et cetera. Okay. Um, now, language as a right. This is nothing new, <laughs> but it is not well accepted yet as a concept. Um, when we talk about bilingual education, you know, bilingual education recognizes the home language as a right. However, when we put a student in an English-only language, we are doing them a disservice. Yeah. Case in point, I started school in my own country, you know, somewhere on the west coast of Africa, um, and I was thrown in an immersion classroom. We were forbidden to use our own mother tongues to speak among ourselves. 
So at noon, you know, when everything closes down there, you know, everybody goes home for lunch. So I went home for lunch and I told my parents, I'm not going back to school. What? You're not going back to school? Why? But we gotta use our languages. We gotta talk among ourselves. If we do, we get punished. Yeah. And there was this, you know, um, animal jaw that you had to carry around your neck. And if you spoke your mother tongue, not only were you beaten up, but yeah, you were, the teacher would whip you and um, uh, all the students would make fun of you and also take turns to, you know, that was the incentive. <laughs> yeah. For you to adopt or learn the school language. Yeah. But UNESCO um, has been advocating for not only the use and maintenance of mother tongue education, but uh, for those language that don't have written languages to be able to use their um, or develop their mother tongue uh, through formal schooling. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, a good example that we have in the United States comes from Puente de Hoso Elementary School in Flagstaff, Arizona, where they have a two-way bilingual education with Navajo and uh, English, or Spanish and English bilingual education. And you can check it out, it's on the website, you, 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 you can see how well they are doing. Yeah. And on this note, I will Turn it over to my dear colleague. <laughs> Thank you, Tanina. It's my section now. I put these markers so that we'd remember who went first, second, etc. So I'm going to talk about these things, the role of oracy. Oracy is a word that you might not have heard before, and it's a word that we'll tell you about. Also, that there are new forms of texts and um, new forms of text structures with the internet revolution, and also that there are new forms of reading as well as new words. So oracy is like parallel to literacy. The idea is that oracy is the speaking skills, not just speaking, but also listening. And literacy is considered to be reading and writing. For a long time, literacy was not expected or not intended to include the oral skills. And we now realize it's much more of a continuum. It's much more of a complete process to become literate in a language. You're learning its sounds. You're learning to make its sounds. You're learning sentence structures by listening. So we really picked up on the importance of oracy when we were doing the first edition of the book. And it's only been proven to be more important over the years. The top road, listening and reading, was often in the past considered to be passive or receptive. You just sit there and listening happens and reading happens. We know that's not true because if listening would make you able to understand the language, you could just keep the radio on all night while there's another language playing on it and you'd wake up bilingual. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. You require interactions. And we know that speaking and writing is productive or interactive, but all four of them together are necessary to become literate and to become fluent in a language. So oracy is something that language teachers have thought about for a long time, but they tended to stress speaking rather than listening. And um, more and more evidence shows that listening is absolutely a key to learning a language and to becoming literate in a language. So um, I'll just give an example for myself. Um, sometimes I listen to All Things Considered when I'm in my car. 
and I might hear it at four o'clock and I might still be in my car at six o'clock. So um, I know some of you guys have to go, that's fine. Don't be a bit embarrassed. I know that you, you're only here for a half hour. We're very happy you're here. No problem if you have to leave. Um, so sometimes I hear a, a feature on All Things Considered at four o'clock and then I'm still in my car at six o'clock and I hear it a second time. And I'm always stunned by how much I missed the first time through. And I just think, did I understand that at all? And I think that's true whether it's your native language or a new language that um, repetition is sometimes necessary to really uh, pack it into your brain for later use. So, um, there are many, many ways in which listening helps build literacy. And uh, we pay a lot of attention to that in the book, and we ask teachers of English language learners to work on listening activities. Working with students every day should involve some listening activities, not just uh, listening to the teacher, but you know, listening to each other, peers, and so on. Now, one thing that we've added in the second edition of the book that wasn't in the first edition is something that we found at um, Cambridge University, Cambridge College in England, which is called the Oracy Skills Framework. And we were absolutely thrilled to find this. It's uh, Dr. Neil Mercer came up with this and, and his team. And um, we've always looked at these two things in the middle, linguistic and cognitive aspects of listening that listening involves all of those things. But what we hadn't paid as much attention to in our previous book was the physical aspect, the voice, body language, and how important that is to listening and to oracy. And then the second one down here, the social emotional aspects of oracy. Part of the skills of listening and speaking are turn taking, being sensitive to what someone says and carrying on a conversation so it doesn't just dive bomb after you say one thing. So you can kind of volley a conversation back and forth. And of course, having confidence. So part of the listening and speaking skill is being able to do what we're doing, standing up here and blabbing and talking to people. And by the way, speaking of uh, blabbing, if any of you on, uh, on not Skype, Zoom, have any questions? There's somebody keeping track of it, um, and you can ask questions, and we would be very happy to answer them. And all of you, too, feel free to interrupt us at any point. That's part of the fun. If you have a question about something, go right ahead. So this is uh, the oral skills framework here that we're talking about as a total thing that involves listening and speaking and social skills and phonology and everything else. We also have a whole bunch of new text structures now that we didn't have 10 years ago, or we had them, but they weren't as important as they are. And the three that we picked out are email, Twitter, and emojis. <laughs> so, okay, for email, have any of you ever had a very embarrassing email experience? Yeah, where you didn't mean to send something out? or you didn't know you were copying or replying to all, you thought you were replying to one person, or you sent something too soon, or whatever, you had second thoughts about it. Well, I certainly have in my own life. Email actually has rules, and part of what you need to teach students of any age is when to answer an email, how to answer an email, when do you let it end? How long do you say, Thank you very much. Do you answer, you're welcome? <laughs> then do you answer, my pleasure? When do you drop it? <laughs> and then questions about how formal it should be and how you decide the formality level. You are emailing your professors now. So, you know, you have to have some protocols about what you put in an email. How concerned are you about grammar and spelling in an email? Can you just let it all go or should you really do spell check on an email? That kind of stuff. I'm seeing knowing smiles here. I think that people have had problems with this. So we need to make it explicit and teach the rules for using email. And also, what is the maximum length? Is there a length after which you shouldn't really be putting it in an email? It should be in some other form, like an attachment or whatever. And then there's Twitter. <laughs> yes, Twitter 45. <sighs> the Twitter presidency. So one of the things that we have with Twitter is the fact that some, all of a sudden these logograms 
these symbols, which do not have pronunciations, become part of the meaning. And the two biggies here are the, um, those two, the at sign or whatever you want to call it, and the, um, the, the pound sign or what we used, we used to have a hashtag. There's a third term for it too. It's evolved quite a bit. But when those are in front of a word on Twitter, you know they mean a, a certain thing, that it means that it's somebody's uh, handle. And, or no, the at is the handle, and then the, the uh, hashtag is the subject. So those are very important to find what you're looking for. They're part of the meaning of it, but you can't pronounce them. They're symbols, they're like Chinese logograms in the sense that they're not alphabet letters. So then you have to figure out retweets, replies, when you're trying to read a tweet and responses to it, that little line down the left side, which tells you that it's a response to the tweet, very important stuff. And then also, can you use a tweet? Can we teach students to write tweets? And uh, one of the people we quote in our book uses tweets to summarize something the students have read. They have 100, is it 40, 140 or 120 characters? Uh, to summarize something. That's a great activity for summarizing. And maybe it's going to double soon, is that right, <laughs> Anthony? <laughs> I think they're going to allow 240 now, or I don't know. And then there's the emojis. Emojis are actually very interesting because um, they're sort of returning us to symbols rather than decodable alphabet letters that have sounds. So one of the big questions is, are emojis really universal? Are the emotions on emojis going to be understood by many different cultures? Well, actually, no, there are big issues. And I, I tried it out at a conference. I brought some emojis that have been passed by the Emoji Association or whatever to see whether uh, people we used, uh, we did a, what do you call those things, where everybody answers. Yes, exactly, to see if they all felt it had the same emotion and people didn't. Sometimes it looks like boredom to one person. It looks like revulsion to another person. So emojis are not universal. And also, um, when you look at a string of emojis, they might constitute a sentence. They sort of have a syntax. What order do you put them in? This is my favorite cartoon, and I'm going to read it out loud if it's too small for people on Zoom. Texting is writing. Have you written all your thank you notes, says mom. Yeah, I texted everyone last night says child. Wait, you sent them as text messages? Is that a problem? Sweetheart, thank you notes are supposed to show some effort, some care. They should be done using cards or paper. It's a way of saying to the recipient, look how appreciative I am. All a text message thank you note says is look at how lazy I am. The kid responds, lazy? Are you looking at how many emojis I put in each one? Are you looking at how many hearts I used? Would you like me to count them? Stop it. I get it. You worked hard. 2,137, 2,138, 2,139. <laughs> so, you know, like, do 10 hearts mean the person loves you more than eight hearts? Or are 12 hearts over the top? All of those questions become important because it's a new text structure. Then there's issues with screen-based reading. When you're reading off a screen, there's a different phenomenon than when you're reading off paper. And um, the research that's been done on this, and there's still a lot that's in progress, is that student comprehension was lower with screen reading than print reading. And it does seem to be improving over time as we become more familiar with it. Many cognitive processes are in play when reading on a screen, but they might be hard to maintain due to multiple uh, activities. And you know how it is. You can look up and there's just other things bombarding you from all directions. And the quote here in this research, in-depth reading can take place with printed or digital text, but it's somewhat at odds with the internet. In other words, the whole idea of the internet is fleeting, fast, you know, in your face, that kind of thing. So um, there's book reading, and then there's screen reading. And there really are differences um, that are going to be really important in the future as we, as children and adults, um, use these tools.
So screen-based reading, there's more of these things. More browsing, more keyword searching, more skimming, backtracking, you know what that is. You just go back a screen and look for something you didn't know was going to be important and all of a sudden it is and you think you better find it again. That might be easier actually with screen reading because when you're book reading and you think, oh, that character didn't look important, but now they are, you have to find the page that the character was on. And then there's skipping too. And there's less of these things, in-depth or concentrated reading, less sustained attention, less proficiency in annotating. Have you ever tried to use annotation on a PDF? It's kind of clunky. doesn't really work very well yet, so we tend not to do it. We still like our Post-it notes, don't we? Our stickers and stuff. So um, all that's happening. And then, of course, there are so many new words so many fun new words. A lot of them are extremely figurative. You can really picture something happening. They're not just abstract words. They're really fun um, and cute. We've got newbies and techies. And <laughs> Do you have a favorite one here? <laughs> That's kind of a new one. And I thought in honor of that, we should imagine what a troll farm might look like. <laughs> Is this a troll farm? <laughs> so there are lots and lots of new words entering through the internet, and we have to figure out what they mean and then use them appropriately. Like for a while it was, do you unfriend or do you defriend? But then I think the mass of internet users decided it's unfriend, right? But, you know, there's a lot of other ones we haven't quite decided about yet. So troll farms. Oh, they must be so cute. <laughs> Here's Leah, and Leah is um, a dear colleague. She uh, was the program director of the ESL uh, bilingual endorsement program for many years, and she's now still working as um, an adjunct. We're very lucky, although she is in retirement to some extent at least. And um, so she's going to talk about her favorite subject, and this is the one that, you know, we just look to her and say, Queen Leah, explain morphemes, please, Queen Leah. So she's going to tell you a little bit about the sexiest subject in the world, morphemes. You can advance the screen. Yeah. Okay. Well, I don't know how sexy they are. Most people find them somewhat dull. <laughs> but... Um, the thing that's interesting about morphemes and what Kristen ended on is the fact that they're words, okay? Words, words, words. If you think of how many words there are in a language, and then if you really look at English closely, it has almost more words than any other language. There's something, maybe it's because everybody wants to speak it because we have dominance now, who knows? But they're always coming in and in more and more and more. So. We have, all of us have a good vocabulary, but the issue with morphology is, and second language learners, as they get older, okay, and they start doing science, and they start doing uh, maybe geography, and they start doing, uh, what else do they learn when they're older, that's hard, uh, ma even math, parts of math, they have to have ways to attack the vocabulary. So morphology is tied into that. So I, I don't think I'm a queen of morphology. I just find it interesting because it's such a, it's very fluid. Uh, I'll just give you quick exam some quick examples. We have words in our language that have been in our language probably for um, 10, for t at least 10,000 years. They change a little bit, but they're still with us, okay? And then we have words that come in yesterday, like emojis and all of those words come and go and come and go. So what that shows you about English, we just have to learn how to handle all that and what do we do with all that? Because nobody's ever gonna remember all that. You get a good dictionary for one thing. So, but what we do with morphemes, they build the words. And um, as you see what we try to teach ELLs and native speakers too, when you see a word like pleasure, please and pleasant, okay? Everybody should hone in on What's similar about it, okay? It's the P-L-E-A-S, okay? So you think, okay, now, you know, that must be important. So that's what we call like a root or the, the word that is the core of other words that can be handed, uh, can be used with it. Like you can say, uh, pleasant, unpleasant, 
pleasure, pleasured. Okay, Ooh. <laughs> please, please. Oh, you see, you can take them and, and move them around somewhat, okay? So this is why we have to, we tackle this. You see the same thing with medicine, m medicinal, and medical, and bomb, and bombard. So I was just going to tell one thing that happens with morphemes is this, you, you're, you can change your pronunciation of the, this, the main morpheme depending on what you put before and after the, the main morpheme. So when I was a kid in school, I'll remember in the sixth grade, I'll never forget this, we were in science class, and the teacher kept talking about centrifugal force, centrifugal force. And he, you know, he went on and on. I think we studied centrifugal force for two weeks, okay, or three. And I, I had no clue what he was talking about. And so I took my book home and I asked my mother, what, oh, he, the teacher keeps saying centrifugal, but I don't know what he's talking about. And she said, well, it's right here. It's right here in your book. I said, oh, centrifugal. And, and she said, oh, you see, if you don't know the pronunciation of the morpheme, you're not gonna click into it. And I said, oh, it's not centrifugal, it's centrifugal. <laughs> How would I have ever known that? So when you teach children, you know, there are these words that you, you need to say them sometimes because it just doesn't dawn on them. So I think that's really interesting. So that's part, okay, next one. So more, the morphemes, we, Chris and I developed all these triangles, which are really very helpful. We have millions of lexical morphemes. And so that's why they're at the very top. And they form the majority of our words. They're the nouns, the verbs, the adjectives, and the adverbs. Those are the heart and core of any language, right? They come and go also, and we can add stuff to them. We can take stuff away from them. There are content words. Uh, they're the, the vital organs. They're the ones that most ELLs, most pe and first language learners also do not have trouble with these words, basically, okay? Good thing. Okay, then we get functional morphemes. In, native speakers of English don't have trouble with them either because we hear them, okay, all the time, and they're part of our sentence. But if you are a second language learner and you see preposition, how many prepositions are there in English? At least 300 to 500, okay? And they change. Every time you put them with another context, they have a different meaning. So they, they are really hard, okay, for second language learners. And they'll ask you, how do I learn these? How do I learn these? Well, the main way you learn these is to listen and read and just kind of let it flow in, right? I don't think you really can learn them. Okay, so the trouble of function words. Okay, then here we go. You have these ones that I still get confused, two, two, and two, okay? Um, it's and it's. How many times in your life have you written IT apostrophe S when it's ITS? If you haven't done it, you are a model student, okay? I bet some of you have done it even as graduate students, okay? And sure enough, the teacher's going to go, uh-uh, you know. So that's an easy one, okay? The other thing about our, our lovely function words is they come out of the Germanic language family, not the Latinate. Most of our nouns come out of the Latinate family. So we have a mixed marriage here in a sense, you know, and they, sometimes they work well together, sometimes they don't, kind of have to just learn them. And um, so then, you know, you're going to get students, especially second language learners or, or young kids who say, what does that mean in these? Well, everyone knows what throw up means, barf, right? <laughs> so if they don't know what throw up is, you know, means the barf, you know what that is, but give up, okay? But then stand up for, What's different between stand up and stand up for? Oh, what is different about that? So, you know, they're, they're tricky. Okay, so uh, many native speakers, including me, I was always, I always had trouble with these as a kid. I still have trouble with them. So I guess that's why that you guys give this to me, <laughs> okay? So the, th the new thing is when the little, you can look at words and you can see how they're put together and that'll pick, give you a, your vocabulary will increase multi, you know, you, you find the root, find all the words. A good dictionary will put them in there for you. It's a good thing to do. It's fun, okay? Your derivational or bound morphemes will help you, help you. They are mainly add a part of speech and they change the grammar. 
As a teacher, I would not even attempt to teach these to any students until they maybe were in high school. This, their function, okay? I would just let them try to absorb it because it's very, very difficult for them to understand why do we even have to worry about this, okay? You don't, but at some point you may become weird like uh, those of us who are into <laughs> linguistics and language, okay? And you kind of want to know what, how does this really work? And so that's what my bound morphemes are, but they, 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 you learn them kind of like as a unit. You don't break them up. Um, next one, I think that's enough on that. So here you have your inflectional morphemes. They're at the very bottom of our triangle. Those are the most interesting. They're most, many of them are verbs, okay? There are seven or nine. It depends on who you talk to. But they, they click on like this. They click on to the root and they change the meaning and the function. So, so here we have some to show you how these work. Okay, some of these I think are just, are, I couldn't figure out if they were real or jokes. But like Tommy, okay, the, uh, the surgeon cut something. Like, uh, who can give me a word that has T-O-M-O-I in it? Yeah, otomy, okay. See how I said Tommy, when you put it with another word, say it, Kristen. See how it changes pronunciation? You can see why I miss centri centrifugal and centrifugal, okay? Uh, ectomy, okay, I think we can think of that. Uh, uh, tonsillectomy, appendix, what's another one? Appendectomy, another? Which one? Oh, what is that? Knee. Oh, great, great, <laughs> that's good, I didn't know that, okay. Uh, ostomy, okay, that one, uh, <laughs> anybody think of some ostomy words? Yeah, when ostomy supplies, we won't go into that, but I think you know what they are. They advertise them on TV all the time, <laughs> late at night, <laughs> so, okay. Plasty, uh, and, uh, see, I don't know these, what is a plasty? Which one? Rhinoplasty. Rhinoplasty. Oh, you get a nose job. Right. See, isn't that interesting? Because nobody ever says, oh, she had rhinoplasty. That's what she had. Nose job. Right? Because it's so hard, but it, we should be able to do that. Um, Pepsi is where the uh, surgeon goes right to the, moves the organ to the right place. Now that's, I don't know. Is that real? Yeah, maybe. And then, <laughs> anybody know? And then the other two, I have no idea. Uh, the surgeon sewed something up. You hope it's he didn't sew up the sponges, but that you sewed up only your body. And then this, uh, the last one is the surgeon made two things stick together. But this just shows you how they vary, how you put them with other words and get the words. So that's the fun thing with morphemes. That's it. I love words. I hope you love them too. Thank you. Thank you, Leah. Careful. And finally, we have one of our star students. We're so fortunate to have Miss DJ Richmond here with us to just uh, talk about how she applies some of these practices in her own classroom. Um, Misty is an NLU graduate. Thanks for coming, you guys. It was wonderful to have you. Take care. And thanks, Professor, for bringing them. Um, Misty has a Master's of Education from National Lewis in, um, from 2008, and she teaches middle school science in the Chicago Public Schools. She is a middle school science specialist, and she is a National Board Certified Teacher. Got that in 2012. She's won a lot of Illinois Science Teaching Awards, Outstanding Teacher of Science Award, the Right Stuff Award, really cool stuff. She presents, she's presented for uh, a grant that uh, Jason Stegemuller and I co-directed, and it was just wonderful. So um, we've asked her back to talk a little bit about some of the um, ways that she can make um, ELLs in her science curriculum um, get some of the concepts that we're talking about. She teaches at James Ward Elementary in the Armour Square neighborhood. With no further ado, Miss DJ Richmond, who's also in the book, by the way. 
so as a, as a quote, not, not like an author yet. Um, but I, a lot of my professors are in this room, which is actually really cool, but I digress. Um, so one of the things that I wanted to talk about is kind of like what I do in the classroom. So as a student, I read the first edition of this book and got a lot of ideas about how I could help the students in my classroom that were learning English as a second language. And so I really just wanted to kind of talk about some of those opportunities for students in the classroom. And so the morphemes that we just talked about, one way to really help students with that, especially in science, is a lot of those morphemes are naturally occurring and they see words that they recognize parts of them and kind of highlighting those for students so that they're able to actually recognize them when they're looking at new words as they're reading and learning new information. So kind of having a word wall similar to this, I don't have this type of word wall in my classroom, but what this would help students to do is as we learn some of these morphemes, having those there so when they're reading and starting to see others in new words, they can start to make some connections between new words that they're learning. And so some ways you'd be able to use something like this word wall would be able to kind of make sure you have those roots available to students. So as they're reading new text and they're experiencing these things for the first time, they can start to make some of those connections and kind of even making it a game. So the same way Leah was kind of making it a game, who can find a word like this, kind of encouraging students to do that same thing helps them to be able to recognize things like that. Um, as I think about this earlier today in class, my students are, we're in a unit with sound and we were looking at wave patterns that we had started collecting from vibrations that were being made. And so one of the words we were looking at today was the word amplify. And we were talking about how the ampli, ampli, you know, what we see with the wave changes as the sound is changing. And so what was really interesting is when I asked the students, well, what words do you know that are related to sound? that look like this word amplitude. And so they were able to, you know, someone was like amplify. In four different classes, a student was able to come up with the word amplify. And so I was like, oh, that's okay. Well, what does amplify mean? And they've had experience with amplify means to like make it louder. And some people have parents or like someone that works like as a DJ. And so they were like, you have an amplifier and it like makes the sound louder. And so then I said, okay, so if we look at this graph, what is this amplitude showing us? And they were able to connect volume with amplitude to be able to be able to explain this graph that they'll be able to use later on as we continue talking about those things. So it really does help them to be able to connect to words that they're using in concepts that they're learning in science class um, and just kind of makes them more aware as they're looking at new words. So another thing that I found very helpful with students with word walls is including visual aids to kind of assist, especially when there are words um, in the English language that have multiple meanings for the same word. And so we started our unit um, with an anchoring event where students kind of came around and I had like a record player for them in the classroom. And so they saw this like black disc and they're like, mm, what's that? And so as it starts to spin, they were like, their faces were like, what, like how, like, and I was like, oh, what do you hear? And they're like, I think I heard voices. I was like, you heard voices? You know, like, so they got really excited, but like they, most of them had never seen a record before. And so when we started talking about, well, how do you think sound is coming from here? They really needed to be able to look at them. But when they saw the word record, the first time when we were like talking about vocabulary, a lot of them wanted to be like record. Like if you record on a video um, or like on television, if you're recording something. And I was like, well, is that the same record that we're talking about? So the word is the exact same look, we say it differently and it has a completely different meaning. And so we wanted to make sure we had a picture of a record that we were talking about attached to it. So when we're using that word, we know how that happens. And so like even today when we talked about volume, one of the students was like, you mean like the space that it takes up? And I was kind of like, well, is that the volume that we're talking about right now? And so like they start to recognize like, like I thought I knew what volume was, you know, like in math and now you're giving me a different you know, context for that word. And so then helping them to kind of connect those things. And so a lot of times having like a visual or some sort of representation kind of helps support them um, in that kind of a way. Um, so one of the things that I find with science that's really helpful with second language learners is this idea that science is so hands-on. 
I bet everyone in here at some point in life remembers a science fair project. Either you were, you had to do one, you had to help someone with one, you like saw someone working on them. And so it's really this idea that students get to be able to present their findings from a project that they've done. And so what comes along with this is all the hands-on experience that they're able to acquire a lot of language as they're doing something. But then it comes to this like scary part of like presenting what you talked about and now you have to share that information with someone else. And so a lot of support in the classroom has to really be there to help students be able to share the information that they learn and really build that confidence like Kristen was talking about earlier. And so one of the things that we do um, a lot in my classroom are things that we call scientist circles where we kind of come together as a whole class to really start talking and processing out what we've been learning in the classroom. And so one of the things that I've, I learned right in my class is that students are going to be speaking and listening faster than they're going to be reading and writing. And what I found is when we have these discussions in class and they're able to say things like, I agree with this person or this is why I believe this. And then after that experience where they have to go back and write something down, there's a lot more confidence there because they're using the language they've heard from their peers. They're using some of the language that they've been repeating from someone else. Because I've also noticed helping um, students repeat what someone else is saying or rephrase what you heard someone say really promotes active listening because you can't really repeat or rephrase something if you'd never heard it and process it the first time. And so like really, providing a lot of opportunities for students to kind of engage in this way has really been helpful in the classroom. And kind of having these STEMs initially are what we kind of use. And then students, as the year goes on, will often have other ones that I notice they start to use. And I'm like, we should add that to our chart. It seems to be something that has helping us to kind of add on to what we want to talk about. And so really just providing a lot of opportunities for students to kind of continue developing their language has been something that I've been working on in my classroom.